الله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهديه الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وأصحابه وأزواجه ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين وسلم تسليما كثيرا يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون أما بعد All praise is due to Allah We praise Him abundantly We seek Allah's forgiveness And we seek Allah's mercy And we seek refuge with Allah from the evil within our souls And the consequences of our bad deeds Verily whomsoever Allah guides no one can lead astray And whomsoever Allah allows to go astray because they do not want any guidance, then no one can guide. And I bear witness that there is no deity worthy of worship except Allah. He is alone with no partners. And I bear witness that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is his slave and his messenger. We ask Allah to exalt his mention and grant him peace and send his salutations, his blessings upon him and upon his companions and wives and all those who follow them on the path of righteousness until the day of recompense. O oh, you who have believed, be mindful of Allah and fear Him the way He deserves to be feared and do not die except in the state of Islam, in the state of submission as Muslims. Brothers in faith, when it comes to Islam, and when it comes to the knowledge you are expected to have of Islam, there are a number of issues that must be addressed. It goes without saying that people are not at the same level in terms of what they know. And while it is acceptable to have this variation. What is not acceptable is that any one of us is ignorant of a matter that is obligatory upon him to be knowledgeable about. There are, let's say, advanced levels that may not be your interest. It's not your field. You don't have that kind of passion, you don't have that zeal. It doesn't concern you much to learn about the intricate aspects of the religion, how to give da'wah, the principles of fiqh, so on and so forth, no issue. It's definitely a form of deprivation. It's a deprivation that one has no such interest because we have discussed many times that the pioneers and the best of people that walked upon earth were the prophets and the messengers and the prophets and the messengers did not leave behind as inheritance, any property, any castle, any land. They left behind knowledge. Whosoever takes it has taken an abundance of wealth. Knowledge will illuminate your path to paradise, bi'idhnillah. It's a form of deprivation. Nevertheless, it's acceptable. What is not acceptable is that you engage in matters where the religion has a say in them and you are completely ignorant about them and so therefore you fall into sin or you fall into shortcomings as in you're not fulfilling the obligations that have been placed upon you and a classic example of that and something that I personally deal with often is the matter of travel the traveler and specifically the prayer of the traveler. You will be surprised how much information we lack in this regard. In fact, most brothers that travel often have not even 
taken the time to study, even if you if you were to take them hypothetically three days to a week, to study everything pertaining to traveling and the prayer while traveling. We go by the convenient fatwa mode. Any practical fatwa that is in agreement with my preference, two thumbs up, I'm good to go, brother. But what if this is not the sound position? Ah, tough luck. What can I do? Well, there's a lot you can do. And it is obligatory on you to study this issue. So that when you travel, even if you're going to follow a position which happens to be quite lenient, at least you can face Allah on Yawm Al-Qiyamah and say that you were convinced based on the textual evidence that this is sound. Because if we were to open up this discussion, according to the madahib of the ulama, you, the issue begins with the very moment of distance, the matter of distance. What is the distance that must be covered for you to say, I'm traveling now? And is there a distinction between back in the days means of transportation and modern means of transportation? So 84 kilometers back then on a horse or a camel might have been quite a distance, but now maybe in an airplane you'll get there in no time, or in a fast car, or a motorcycle. Do these rulings change? Or do you stick to the same number? And what about the number itself? 84 kilometers, 80 kilometers? Is that something that the Prophet ever spoke about in terms of numbers? No. No. It's just ishtihad. A matter of a scholar exerting his knowledge based on the, the distance the Prophet covered at some point in time and due to which he could combine the prayers or he shortened the prayers. So it was all done by some sort of analogy. And so you find the most popular opinion, if you want to be in terms of sound opinion, it is actually what the urf stipulates. Urf is what the local people stipulate. If the people consider you going from such place to such place to be travel, the local people of that area, then it is travel. And if they don't consider it to be travel, it ain't. No matter how much you want it to be. So those scholars don't even look at the distance. They say, Talar Makkah. I'm going up to Makkah. It's like down the street. Makkah is 45 minutes if you're a, a, a maniac when driving, if you're a reckless driver. 45 minutes, 40 minutes. Some people get there, mashallah. They brag. Ya Barakallah, you risk your life and the risk of other Muslims on the way to Makkah. Bingo. That's the way to go. Very nice because it's a Formula One race here. Reckless drivers are always bragging about how fast they go. So, can you say I'm traveling to Makkah now? Do you pack a luggage when you go to Mecca to pray in the Haram and come back? I'm just raising questions for you to be aware of what's going on. I'm not going to give you all the answers now. Because whatever answers I give you are going to be based on the opinion that I adhere to. And the opinion I adhere to may not be the right one for you. As in, it may be either too strict or too lenient. You need to study this on your own, brother. And you need to look into the matter and the opinions of the scholars and then Allah knows in your heart what you believe is the sound opinion. This is the one that you are obliged to follow. Not the convenient one, but the right one. The right one is the one. Then once we cover the issue of distance, is it distance, is it based on earth, what the local people consider, you go into the duration. Is it three days? Is it four days? Once you reach a place, after four days you consider yourself to be a muqeem. And because of this opinion, you have all these people that will come from uh, you know, any country in the world and they think they stay in Jeddah for four days, then they do Umrah from Jeddah. Their miqat is Jeddah. Why all I've been here for four days, I'm a muqeem. MashaAllah, tabarakallah. Getting a fatwa from one, one side of the world and placing it on the other side of the world because it is more practical this way. 
And the truth of the matter is, this doesn't work. You have to go to the Miqat. You have to go to the Miqat. Because you don't live in Jeddah. And you stay for four days doesn't make you a Jeddah in any way, shape or form. You're still a traveler. We have evidences that some of the Sahaba stayed in certain countries for six months or even two years and they considered themselves to be travelers shortening and combining the Salah the whole duration of the two years. Like Umar and Ibn Abbas and many others. But I don't want to shock you with this information right now. Just be aware. Be aware of what's going on. So what determines when do you know whether you are, uh, uh, you can, you have to now complete the salah or you can continue to shorten the salah? Again, this is depending on the madhahir. The Hanbalis have an opinion that is usually four days or more. The Shafi and the Maliki are four days or, or less, even less. Meaning once you decide four days, it doesn't have to be more, you are muqeem. And then you have the uh, Ahnaf, the Hanafiya who go up to 15 days. 15 days, you're not your traveler. After 15 days, you have to now pray complete prayers. Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah said, there's no evidence from the Quran or the Sunnah that any day or number has to do with the subject matter. If Allah Azza wa Jal wanted us to know exactly when do you become a regular person, as in you're no longer a musafir, then that would have been clearly revealed. There's no such ayah, there's no such hadith. And therefore, as long as you're there, but you're not a, you're not a mustawtin. Mustawtin or a muqeem is like our condition. All of us came from some country living in Saudi Arabia. Until further notice, you want to, you probably want to be here until you die. You probably want to be here as long as you have a job. You're, you're obviously a traveler in a sense that you left your home country, but you cannot be considered a traveler now that you live in Saudi Arabia. You're a muqeem. So now the ahkam of a resident apply to us. But if you were to travel to another country for X amount of time for some business, then according to that opinion, you are a traveler the whole time. Because you don't intend on staying there. You have not moved your furniture, moved your family, and you consider yourself to be a resident. And we have evidences that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in, in the in Fatih, he stayed in Mecca for 19 days, shortened in the Salah. In Tabuk, he stayed for 20 days, shortened in the Salah. In Hajjat al Wada, he was there for 10 days, shortened in the Salah. And Shaykh al-Islam uses these opinions among others. And the ayah in the Quran, وَإِذَا ضَرَبْتُمْ فِي الْأَرْضِ فَلَيْسَ عَلَيْكُمْ جِنَاحٌ أَنْ تَقْصُرُ مِنَ الصَّلَاةِ And if you travel throughout the land, then there's no blame on you to shorten the salah. He says this is a general ayah. It applies to anybody who travels. Therefore, as long as you're traveling, then you have the rules and the concessions of the musafir, which include wiping over your socks for three days, instead of one day, instead of 24 hours, and obviously the matter is of shortening the combined in the salah. But again, that is an opinion. It might sound very convenient, but are you convinced that it's the one pleasing to Allah? That's the question. You can't reach that conclusion unless you read. Because you will be concerned when you see that many of the made imams did not adopt this opinion. Many of the major Imams did not adopt this opinion. They said it's a matter of safety, Akhi. This is Salah. You can't play with Salah. After four days, consider yourself to be a Muqeem and just pray regularly. But when you read about these issues, when you educate yourself about them, then you will have that understanding. Just, just like many of the scholars, they would read and they would seek Allah's facilitation to help them understand what they're learning. To make it easy for them to understand what they're learning so they can apply it in their lives. We ask Allah to make us like them. It is important to dedicate this time. If you cover the subject of duration, then we go into the area of, is there a relationship between joining and shortening? Meaning every time you shorten the salah, do you have to join? Or you, you might have to shorten, but you don't have to join. That's another discussion. Some of the scholars say combining the prayers, joining as in combining, is subject to facilitation. Meaning if you're staying in a country and there's no need for you to combine the prayers, don't. You will still shorten the salah. Shortening means dhuhr and asr and isha will become two instead of four. Fajr doesn't change, maghrib doesn't change. And some say, no, 
once you have the concession to shorten, then you also have the concession to combine. And therefore, at each time, you may pray Dhuhr or Asr at either the time of Dhuhr or the time of Asr. And the same applies to Maghrib and Isha. And this is most convenient and logical to the travelers who go on business trips. When you go on a business trip, you're in somewhat of an unknown condition. You don't know when the meeting will finish, you don't know when you will be, you know whether there will be a masjid, you will be clear, clear, close to a masjid. There's a lot of uncertainties. Not like when you're back home, you know your working hours are from this time to that time, and you'll be back home at this time. When traveling, you have a different set of situations. And so it becomes convenient to, to combine the prayers at the time of either. This is from the mercy of Allah to the ummah. And no one should say, no, I, I, I want to play safe. I don't want to shorten the salah. I want to play fully. I want to pray fully. You cannot say that. You cannot do that. The Prophet وسلم, said, Allah loves that you accept his concessions the same way he loves that you leave alone sinfulness. It's a ruqsa from Allah. It's a, it's a gift from Allah. It's a sabaka from Allah. You say, no, thank you. You accept it, yeah. it's from Allah. So these matters are from Allah. We accept them. But we need to have awareness we need to have some serious awareness. Otherwise you travel back home to your home country on your annual visit or annual vacation. If you don't know what you're doing, you might, you might ruin all of your prayers. You might ruin your prayers from the time you get on the airplane, which I will discuss in the second part of the khutbah, inshallah, and then during your stay over there, and then when you come back, if you don't have proper knowledge of how to carry yourself, and how to conduct yourself, and how to manage your salawat, why you are traveling. It's an effort that you must exert. And we shouldn't be miserly with our own selves. Because if we were asked to learn something pertaining to our job, many of us will be happy to learn that crash course for two days, three days, or one week if it's going to enhance my work performance and my uh, productivity. And what about your work performance productivity with your Lord? I think it is more worthy. We ask Allah Azza wa to make us among those who listen to the reminder and follow the best of it. I seek forgiveness for you and for myself. Wa sallallahu wa sallam ala Muhammad. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabiya Muhammad. So you're on an airplane and it's time for salah. And I've seen this many times. A person just sitting, Allahu Akbar. The airplane is going away from the Qibla and in their place, Allahu Akbar, and they pray. That salah is invalid. Mark my words. And as far as I know, there's no difference of opinion among the scholars. I don't know of a single scholar that will say that this salah is valid. This salah is invalid. It will only be valid if certain conditions are met and I will explain to you. First and foremost, standing in the salah is something that you must do, otherwise the salah is not counted for the obligatory prayers. For the nafila, for the voluntary, the Prophet وسلم, used to pray on his mount, on the animal that was carrying him, in whichever direction he was going while sitting down. No issues there. You want to pray duha, you want to pray the nafila, the sunnah before Lord, after Lord, knock yourself out. In whichever direction the airplane is going, and while sitting, say, Allah, I'm going to pray Jazakallah khair, and you're better than those who are not praying, for sure. But for the obligatory prayer, you must stand up and you must face the qibla. It's a condition for the salah. Otherwise, the salah is invalid. So what do you do? There are a number of scenarios. All of them are going to be hypothetical. Let's assume it's Fajr time. And you know, while traveling, Fajr time is very short. By the time you see the, the light, next thing you know, khalas, you're right in front of the sun. So you have a very short span of time. In this short span of time, you are obliged to ask 
the flight attendants where the Qibla is. Or if you have a phone with a compass, then you have to use your phone. You have to make an effort to find out where the Qibla is. And then you must make an effort to pray while standing. That said, it could be that according to this airline, this is a no-no. Meaning there's no way they will let you. In that case, you may not say, Khalli walli, khalas, I'm going to pray and then forget them and then create an issue for yourself and for fellow Muslims and la qadr Allah, something happens to the airplane, it becomes your problem. In which case, now you have an excuse, then and only then, when the time of Fajr is about to go and you have absolutely no choice, you may pray sitting down. But let's say it's door time. And you're going to Riyadh, or you're going to Dammam, or you're going to Tabuk, or whatever. Because you're a traveler, your time for Salah now is from the beginning of Dhuhr until Maghrib. From the beginning of Dhuhr until Maghrib time, because it's until Asr. The end of Asr is at Maghrib time. This whole time you have to pray. You may not choose to pray on the plane sitting, and now face the Qibla when you know you will land in the airport and you can pray in the airport Dhuhr and Asr combined. You understand? So then, you once you have a, a window to be able to pray before the time ends, you may no longer pray sitting down. Only when there's absolutely no way out. Time of Salah, meaning let's say you travel also at Asr time and you didn't get the chance to pray Dhuhr. And it's almost Maghrib and you know you will not land before Maghrib, you will miss Maghrib. If Maghrib comes in, you missed your Dhuhr and Asr, then and only then you may pray sitting down after you try to pray standing. And the same applies for the Qibla. If you're able to find the Qibla, then you need to pray in the Qibla direction. If you're unable to find, then you become excused for inability. The bottom line or the equation is, only inability allows you to have these concessions. Once you're able, you're not allowed and the Salah is invalid. These are things that we need to know. These are things that we need to be aware of. Because you might render your salawat invalid because you never looked into it. You just saw Fulan praying sitting down. You say, well, MashaAllah, this looks good. Then you pray sitting down as well. You cannot. You have to stand up in the salah. Then there's a lot more pertaining to airplanes depending on the duration of the flight and what is the time that you follow. By what time do you go? By the time of the country that you left or the time that you arrived? And if you were to open up the discussion on fasting and breaking the fast while traveling, that's a whole other subject matter that the time does not allow to address. But why don't you find these things interesting for you to read about them on your own? They probably are interesting. But we have a lot of shayateen, a lot of shayateen from among humans in jinn that can't continuously distract us from these important matters. We need to fight back. There is a time, there should be a time, an allocated time on weekly basis, on monthly basis, on daily basis, whatever Allah facilitates, but allocate some time to learn. It's beautiful to read the Quran if you're allocating time for reading the Quran. But reading the Quran without understanding it, without learning the deen, doesn't get you far. It does not get you far. There should be an allocation for other matters of the religion as well. We should learn other aspects of the religion as well, not only how to recite the Book of Allah. The objective of reciting the Book of Allah is implementation. And the Prophet said, Acquiring knowledge is an obligation upon every Muslim. Every one of us has an obligation to learn. The things which you don't have to learn are the things that you're not involved in. If you travel at all, if you travel once in your lifetime, for that travel you need to learn the ahkam and the rulings of a traveler. For you to be able to travel properly and perform your salah properly and fast or break your fast properly and so on and so forth. Just like if you make money and you have zakah, you have to learn the rulings of zakah so you can pay off the zakah. And if you go into fast, you have to learn the rulings of fasting. Or if you want to do umrah and hajj, you have to learn the rulings of umrah and hajj. How you go to the house of Allah and you go to do umrah without any knowledge? You're just going to follow the crowd? 
If you follow the crowd, trust me, there's no way on earth your umrah will be valid. People say, people do whatever comes to mind. We have very, we have a very strict code in terms of, in terms of the, the, the things we're supposed to do. For example, when doing tawaf, when you get to the green light or the hajar al-aswad, you're supposed to hold the hajar al-aswad and kiss it if you're able to. Technically speaking, it's almost impossible all of the time. And so we are told to gesture by saying Allahu Akbar, meaning resembling, it's almost resembling that you grabbed it. What do people do today? Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allah, 16 times, 17 times, 5 times, kissing 3, 4 times. You tell me, Akhi, what is this? He looks at you like you're some crazy alien from, from Jupiter. Like, what do you want? And he just keeps going. Ya Akhi, and you're worshipping Allah according to your uncle or according to the Prophet Sallallahu What are you doing? A person will do a whole umrah, and then when it comes to the, the, the one act of worship that concludes his umrah, which is cutting the hair, John Travolta's hair is so beautiful, he can't ruin it. So he gets uh, a small scissor, like women, and he gets one piece from here, Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. What is this, Ya Akhi? Ah, khalas, I removed it. This is not acceptable, Ya Shaykh. This is not, this is not Umrah. You're, you're scared, but your hair is that valuable? Ma fi mushkila, don't shave. I'm crazy, okay, don't shave. Shaving is extreme. It's more rewarding, but it's extreme. Cut your hair at the barber, even if it's one centimeter, if it's half a centimeter, it doesn't have, it's not about the length, but he has to remove your whole hair. In a sense, he has to remove a regular haircut. When you go to the barber, he gets hair from every part of your head. That is a haircut. That is what you're supposed to do. You go to a barber, and the barber removes hair from the front and the sides and the back, even if it's a very short, Length, no problem, because your hair is so important, you don't want to lose it, no problem, Islam accommodates you. But for you to be so stingy that you only get three hairs out of your head, and you think you just did Umrah, it's a disaster. You know according to the scholars, that Umrah is not sound, and you remain in the state of, and then you take off your clothes, right? You put on your shower, you put on your clothes, the whole time you are violating your Ihram, because according to the scholars, even a month later, you're still in Umrah. Your Umrah has not been finished. It's still pending until you cut your hair. Little things. But how many people read before they do Umrah? No. Inna wajadna aba'ana ala ummah. We find our forefathers like this. Khalas, it's, it's in the heritage of the family. We all follow the same methodology. Doesn't fly. I in, invite myself and you to learn about these issues, especially traveling. At least you have a peace of mind, serenity, and you meet Allah, Yawm al Qiyamah, knowing that you studied the subject matter and that you are following the opinion that you believe is most pleasing to Allah. You will forever be grateful to yourself for doing so instead of living in the state of doubt all these years, not knowing that your salawat while traveling were actually, they had issues. So we ask Allah Azza wa Jal to make us among those who understand and apply. Allahumma ya muqallib al-qulub, thabit qulubana ala deenik. Allahumma ya musarif al-qulub, isrif qulubana ala ta'atik. Rabbana la tuzak qulubana ba'da adhabaytana wa hab lana min ladunka rahmatan innaka anta al-wahab. Allahumma alimna ma yanfa'una wa anfa'na bima alamtana wa zidna alman ya adha al-jalali wa al-ikram. اللهم آت نفوسنا تقواها وزكها أنت خير من زكاها أنت وليها ومولاها وأنت على كل شيء قدير اللهم اغفر للمسلمين والمسلمات والمؤمنين والمؤمنات الأحياء منهم والأموات ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار وصلي اللهم وسلم على النبي المختار